the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brethren, to Abraham were the promises made and to his seed. He saith not, and to his seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now this I say, for the testament which was confirmed by God, the law which was made after 430 years, does not disannul to make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then was the law? It was set because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom he made the promise, being ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. Now a mediator is not of one, but God is one. Was the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could give life, verily justice should have been by the law. For the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by the faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul tells us today that the promises made to Abraham were fulfilled in Christ. This means that our Lord Jesus Christ is the sole means of salvation. That is to say, only by being united with him in baptism, faith and grace, at least at the moment of death, can we be saved. Since this union with him is a union with his mystical body, the Church, we can express the same truth with the words, outside the Church there is no salvation. This truth, which we may call the most important practical thing for anyone to know, has, in the last two generations, been cast into doubt by the very people whose duty it is to teach it, and I mean the men of the church. Perhaps the way to God is not solely supernatural by baptism, faith and grace, they must ask themselves, but also natural by just living a good life. I don't refer, of course, to all churchmen, but to a significant number. And so their teaching has been ambiguous and oracular, admitting of different interpretations, or sometimes true and sometimes false, or sometimes simply silence. Locuti sunt falsa, iam non es profeta. They have spoken false things. There is no longer a prophet. The light of the faith that they are duty-bound to direct unto the world has grown dim. The source of light on the earth, which is the, which is the church, seems to be entering into an eclipse. One consequence and expression of this doubt about the faith, which at the same time spreads and compounds it, is that enterprise known as ecumenism. The word comes from the Greek, oikumene, which means the inhabited earth, or in other words, the whole world. It has then, this enterprise, a pretension to universality. It in fact originates from the attempt of Protestants of different denominations to find common ground of their common missionary activities. In recent years, ecumenism has become the name for gatherings between Catholics and non-Catholic Christians, and indeed also between Catholics and representatives of other religions, with a view to affirming what they have in common. But such gatherings had already been condemned by Pius XI in his encyclicum, encyclical Mortalium Animos, of the year 1928 with the prohibition of attending, I quote, attending and promoting gatherings of Catholics and non-Catholic Christians or Catholics and members of other religions with a view to finding a common basis for spiritual life. In the same encyclical, he forbids the hierarchy to promote such things. 
The danger of such gatherings, as we have said, is that it spreads and compounds doubt about the Catholic faith and that the Catholic Church is the unique means of salvation. Already in the 19th century, popes specifically condemned the theories that other Christian denominations could be vehicles for salvation. The Blessed Pius IX condemned the error under the title of latitudinarism in his encyclical Quanto Conficiamo Merore of the year 1863, condemning the false doctrine that, I quote, it is possible to arrive at eternal salvation although living in error and alienated from true faith and Catholic unity. Similarly, Gregory XVI, in his encyclical Mirare Vos of 1832, condemns the broader error of what is called indifferentism, that, I quote, it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion as long as morality is maintained. How do such ecumenical gatherings cast doubt upon the faith and the church's claim to be unique means of salvation? First, by suggesting that all Christian denominations and all religions are somehow the same. But how can the Catholic faith and the Lutheran belief, for example, be the same if the former teaches that there are seven sacraments and the latter only two, to give but one instance, to give but one instance. How can Catholicism be the same as Judaism if the former teaches that baptism, faith in, the, in Christ as the Messiah and membership of the church are necessary for salvation and the latter teaches that circumcision and membership of the synagogue are necessary and deny that Christ is the Messiah? How can Catholicism be the same as Buddhism if the former teaches that the ultimate reality is being, which is God, who created the world, which is good, and whom we are de destined to adore in heaven for all eternity after death? And the latter teaches that the ultimate reality is nothingness, that there is no God, that the world was not created, that the world is not good but bad, and that at our death we will dissolve into nothingness. How is Catholicism, how can it be the same as Islam when Islam denies that the Blessed Trinity and denies that Christ is God and that heaven is a vision of Christ and the Blessed Trinity but claims that it is a place of sensual delights. Yeah. Ecumenical gatherings cast doubt upon the faith, secondly, by suggesting that what matters is what we have in common with other Christians in the spirit of the original Protestant ecumenism and with other religions rather than what separates us. People speak of, inverted commas, elements of truth and sanctity in both cases. But in regard to other Christians, elements of the faith are not sufficient for salvation, but the whole faith. The faith is an absolute. You either possess the faith in its entirety or you do not possess it at all. If I have a ticket for Dubai and I want to go to Sydney, I will have to get off the plane at Dubai. Possessing a ticket is an absolute. I either have the ticket or I do not. If I do not have it, I cannot reach the destination which I want to reach. Similarly with the faith, I either possess it or I do not. If I do, I can reach my destination. If I do not, I cannot reach it. In regard to other religions, the Catholic Church has no shared elements with them as religions, that is to say on the supernatural level, but only on the natural level as systems that are to some extent rational. Islam, for example, professes a creator God, but this is simply a natural truth which can be reached by reason alone and is not anything which is common to two religions as such. 
But in any case, whatever Catholicism has in common with other Christian denominations and religions, what matters is not what we have in common, but what separates us. Because what separates us is the faith, and the faith holds the key to eternal life. If the church and the church alone has this key, then she must seek to open the door with that key to all men, not to hide the key or to act as though all have their own key. If I were a political prisoner of Saddam Hussein in a prison with others awaiting execution, and if I knew that one of the prisoners had a key to escape but the others did not, should I be attending to what all the prisoners have in common, or should I be attending to what was special about one of them, in this case the fact that he held a key to escape from the prison? I would approach this prisoner, if I had any sense, and find a way of escaping with him and with all the others. There are three main problems with ecumenism. My dear people, I won't keep you very much longer, but it is an important subject, so I will go into these details. I ask for your patience. There are three main problems with ecumenism. First, it involves the wrong sort of love. Love seeks the good of another. It is a form of love to have friendly relations and to consort with members of other Christian denominations and of other religions, but not to the extent of making them think that they are in the right. Ecumenical love is a love of affection. It is natural. It seeks a political and temporal good. Catholic love, by contrast, is the love, is the authentic sort of love in this context. It is the virtue of charity, a supernatural love, which seeks a spiritual, eternal good for all men, the beatitude of heaven. The second problem of ecumenism is that it is not based on the truth, on reality. The reality is that only the church can save man, and so our dealings with those outside the church and our prayers for them must correspond to that truth. Otherwise, we would not be realistic. As mentioned before, reality must be the basis of action. Similarly, knowledge of reality must be the basis of love. And in the most general sense, truth must be the basis of good. Ecumenism, by contrast, ignores reality and truth and precipitates itself onto the good, or what it feels to be the good, without a basis in reality. It is interested in love, but in love which is detached from truth. If a drunkard asked me for 10 pounds, it would not be an act of love to give it to him. Or at any rate, it would not be an act of the right form of love. Love must be based on truth, on reality. The third and root problem of ecumenism is that it amounts to a sort of surrogate Catholicism. As we have seen, it makes a claim to universality in its signification of world, just as Catholicism has a claim to universality, meaning entirety. Catholic is entire or universal in different ways, but above all, in being a religion which aims at bringing the truth to the entire world. Ecumenism, by contrast, is universal in representing the world as it is, with its mixture of truth and falsehood, good and evil. It is syncretistic. Catholicism has an ideal. It has a vision of how things should be and aims to realize that vision. Ecumenism has a vision of how things are and is happy to leave them as they are. And so confusion arises, confusion and syncretism, confusion pouring together, syncretism mixing together. Doubt is compounded and spread. The light of the faith grows dim. People think it does not matter what we believe. What is important is how we act. They fall into a merely natural ethics rather than a pursuit of supernatural virtues. Natural ethics no longer guided by the faith, what is more, 
humanism in a word. Otherwise, if they're not of good will or of less good will, they become prey to fallen nature. So to one love or another, but loves detached from the truth. And so, by the intercession of our most blessed mother, whose nativity we celebrate today, we pray with the words of our most glorious and venerable Roman rite, Emi te lucem tuam et veritatem tuam, send forth thy light and thy truth. O God, O God, send forth our Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the uncreated light and the ultimate truth. May he come quickly to judge the living and the dead. Send him forth in holy communion to enlighten us. Send forth thy light of reason so we may understand the natural truth. Send forth the light of faith so we may understand supernatural truth, so we may understand God and our final destiny. Send forth thy light to dispel the darkness of ignorance and sin, to drive away and put to flight the gods of the false religions who are all devils. Enlighten all men that come into this world with the light of reason and the light of faith, so that all might come to a knowledge of the truth and all might be saved. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.